next guest is one of the first guys I ever had in studio for when I first started doing podcasting. It's Nick Scousius, uh, six seasons of the NBA, former member of Team Canada, uh, senior men's team. What's up, Nick? How we doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? Thank you guys for having me on the show. Yeah, dude, it's great to have you. Great to have you as always. So uh, let's let's get right into this team, man. Um, it's been a nail biter so far against Greece. Uh, tight one against Australia in the first half, but they kind of cruised to a double digit victory in the second. They look great. Has anything surprised you about this iteration of the men's team so far? I don't think anything's been surprising per se, but I have been impressed with them. And what really stands out to me is I think, as you've seen with Team USA throughout the exhibition games, it's it's really hard to just slap together a team of NBA players and, mm-hmm. and then throw them out there in FIBA competition and tell them to go dominate um, and, you know, have those guys play with chemistry and whatnot. But this Canada team has looked solid. They look like they belong. Uh, they have fun playing together. They play the right way. They're playing with purpose and pride. And I think that's the thing that stands out most to me is in the past, I would say that maybe – the Canadian players and myself included maybe haven't taken as much pride in playing for Canada as, you know, some of these other guys do playing for Spain and Greece and, and, you know, what it may be. But I think at this point, these guys really care. And I I think it shows on this stage and, you know, having that pride of having Canada on your chest and having it mean something uh, that goes a long way. And I think this group has it. Where do you see that the most? Uh, to be honest, I just see it in the way they play and how happy how happy they are for each other and each yeah. other's success. Like, you see guys making the right play. You see guys standing up on the bench, and there's no sulking or pouting, you know, when – because it's tough. You know, everyone's used to playing a lot of minutes. Everyone's coming into that with the expectation they're going to get minutes. And, you know, unfortunately, guys have to take a back, a back seat sometimes uh, when you play for your country and you have all these guys who are really talented. And so – just the camaraderie and, you know, the, you know, making the right pass, playing the right way, being excited for each other. I think that goes a long way and that's not something that comes easily for these guys. So uh, that's what stood out to me so far. Yeah. I think the qualifier tournament, you really saw that too, right? That they bonded during that time. Um, They really seem to, they really seem to enjoy Dylan Brooks and like the antics and the personality. Like it's like, Mm -hmm. it's like an inside joke that they're, they're all in on that they they love it they're not annoyed by it it's not distracting in any some way and when he does play so far in this tournament and in the last one where he's been where he was brilliant you know he's the mvp but he's he hasn't done anything that's like compromised a victory i think that that's been a, a real thing they clearly have a pecking order with shea gilgis alexander at the the very top of it where it's like okay Things get tough. This is where we're going. But you're right. The rotations have been good. They play great defense. You know, like they really work hard on that end. They know that that's one of their identity pieces, especially like the the perimeter defense. But you're right. Like they they really do seemingly get along and buy in. And, and you made a point there that I actually did want to ask you about, about, you know, throwing the NBA collection together. You usually look at these other nations where guys play together for a very, very long time. And there's an understanding of like their rotations and their responsibilities and their coaching staffs. And I am curious, like you're a guy who's very connected to the program. You're a part of the program. When when do you think that started to shift? Like, is there something that you can point to where you go, Hey, my era from that, like 2015 team where you did have buy-in from guys going, but maybe not that same buy-in that you're talking about from a pride standpoint. Is there something that you're aware of that created that change within Canada basketball? You know, I, I'm not sure I can pinpoint um, a specific moment, but I'll give credit to, you know, the whole higher ups at Canada basketball, starting with, you know, with Rowan Barrett. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they've they've made a concerted effort over the years to, you know, do everything they can to get these guys together every summer, whether that be for training sessions um, and just getting that commitment from the guys to get to the point where it's like, you know, for Team USA, uh, when they come around, like all the top guys, they want to they want to come play, and mm-hmm. I think it's cool to put put on that USA uniform, and I think that's what Canada has been wanting to do for a long time, and I think it's finally gotten there to the point where all the top guys are passionate about coming back and playing together and representing mm-hmm. the country, and I think that's that's like the most important thing coming into this kind of event is there needs to be that pride and passion, and and these guys have it, and. Um, man, you talk about Shea. This guy is he, – he, man, he's so special. He's so fun to watch. And you talk about the pecking order. Um, you know, obviously he's, he's been, you know, just from a name standpoint, their top guy and one of the best players in the world. But just the trio of RJ Shea and Dylan mm-hmm. Brooks, like 
for two, you know, through two games, they're they're 38 for 65 from the floor. So it's been efficient. Yeah. They're playing the right way. They're getting good shots. And then you mentioned the defense too. Uh, in the Australia game where they somewhat struggled in the half court, they ratcheted things up on the defensive end in the second half and started getting out in transition for easy buckets. So they do know their identity, you know, and they play into their strengths, which is is good for them moving forward. Yeah. So you know, obviously in basketball, there's always like uh, international players that they get the the leap perspective wise when they're wearing their country's uniform. Like Dennis Schroeder is one of them recently, right? He wins the MVP of that tournament. You go, oh, is it uh, you know L.A. Lakers Dennis Schroeder or is it Germany Dennis Schroeder? Like which guy are you getting in this game? And I do love that Canada so far. Like Dylan Brooks and R.J. Barrett specifically, good players in the NBA, right? Like, no question about it. But so far, when you're watching them at this tournament and at past ones, you go, oh, uh, now this gets to be, you know, FIBA Brooks, FIBA R.J. Barrett. I- I'm curious. Let's start with R.J. What do you think it is about his game that translates so well to international play? Well, you look at the majority of his buckets, they've been either catch and shoot threes without hesitation. And then it's also the slashing in transition and throughout the half court. Um, he, I mean, he's, his strides are so long. I'm, I'm not sure what it is about the FIBA game, but he has looked phenomenal mm-hmm. just getting to the bucket, finishing through contact. Um, and Dylan, Dylan's one of those guys. He just plays with so much swagger. Like it doesn't yeah. matter whether it's FIBA, NBA. Like he's competitive and he's playing with swagger every time he steps out on the floor. So, um, you know, I'm not surprised to seeing you know that these guys are having success, whether it be at the FIBA level or NBA level. But again, it's just how they're doing it together, and it's 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 just looked right. It's been free flowing. Uh, and as I said, you could see that camaraderie and chemistry out there, which is most important. So I do want like, you know, you mentioned that maybe your uh, age group didn't have as much pride playing for Canada or much of this camaraderie. But, you know, you were on that 2015 team that I do think changed uh, the bar when it came to the expectations from fans for people showing up like you guys went. It was a team chock full of NBA players like you were there. Wiggins was there. Olenek was there. I actually forgot that in the Venezuela game when I was looking, you know, back on that, which is, was hard to do. Olenek had 34 points in that game. <laughs> I was like, he's only known for yeah. the, the turnover at the very end, but he had 34 points. I was like, my God, I forgot what a beast he was in that contest. But yeah. Do, do you remember kind of the process when this first started, like looking back on it, when you guys all started to go and yeah, represent as pros to that tournament, this is kind of a two parter. One was actually buying in to go to the tournament, but also how devastating that loss was in terms of creating or a a fallout where it made it harder for guys to go back. Yeah, well, I think that was the first year where we, for the first time, had, uh, you know, know, about a dozen NBA players to choose from, and we were kind of like, all right, well, this is the first time we could legitimately put together almost an all NBA roster and, Mm -hmm. you know, probably one of the only countries that could do so. So that was, I think for us, the first thing, like, man, we should really give this a go and, you know, try to represent for our country and, um, you know, go all in on it. Cause it is a big time commitment. You know, you give up your whole Mm -hmm. summer to basically do the exhibition games, do the training, the, uh, and whatnot, the travel, and so, man, that loss to Venezuela was, to this day, that was the most devastating loss I've ever been a part of. Uh, just because we had kind of handled them pretty easily in the pool play before that. You guys were plus um, 135 in pool play. Point differential. It, I mean, we were, we were steamrolling yeah. through the competition. So there was just a confidence that, you know, we're going to win every game. And I think that kind of backfired on us because obviously in a one-game scenario, these guys are all professionals they're all really good players and so uh we maybe let our guard down a little bit and it was just everything that could go wrong went wrong that game and you mentioned kelly you know kelly had a great game for us it was just everyone else was kind of you know we just couldn't pick up the slack you know no one else really had a great game and venezuela they brought their a game when it mattered most yeah i i like so when you guys lost that game i was at an ex-girlfriend's condo And I just remember I walked outside and she smoked cigarettes and I just sat on my balcony. And I think I smoked like six or seven cigarettes just in a row looking out at the city going like, we're cursed. (laughs) This is never going to happen. Listen, listen, I, I, we, we went back to the locker room after that and 
you know, God bless Steve Nash because he was the general manager at that time. Yeah. And everyone was just dead silent, devastated. Of course. And Steve came in the locker room and he was, you know, just trying to rally the troops and just, you know, encourage us and let us know, hey, man, we'll, we, you know, we're going to get another opportunity another time and keep your heads up and wherever. I give him a lot of credit because that it wasn't easy to come into that locker room and give any kind of speech just because we like you don't even know what to say in that moment. We were just all so devastated. But again, I think that could have been maybe a starting point for a lot of these guys. And, um, you know, you kind of get that first wound where you're like, man, I, I don't want ever want to feel that again. Yeah. And so maybe that did serve as motivation moving forward for a lot of those guys who did return and, and are playing on this team. Well, yeah, there's, there's been some guys that just remain staples of the program, right? Like what was it the next summer? There was the last chance. And I think Corey Joseph went to that and maybe Tristan, maybe I think Kelly Linick tried to go that, but then he got hurt and Miami was like, no, <laughs> you slipped. You're not going. So that dude, like a couple of them definitely used it as motivation to want more and keep going. But it really did seem like for a little while that it had a, a pretty outsized impact just in terms of some of the stuff you're talking about on certain guys where it was like, Hey, the rotation didn't work or the ball, like the amount of ball I ended up getting didn't work. The loss was so devastating that it really did seem like the program took a step back for a few years after that loss. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I'm not going to say that that loss, you know, derailed the program for a little bit. But I think also what's helped and, and what's changed is a lot of the guys that are playing on this team, mm-hmm. uh, believe it or not, it, it helps having guys on, you know, secure long-term deals in the NBA. Because I know for me, that was one of the hardest parts about committing to play for Canada the entire summer was, you know, I was constantly on like one year vet minimums and in and out of the, in and out of the league. And then, you know, at times if you're a free agent, it doesn't make sense for you to go out and risk getting hurt in a competition where, you know, you're not getting paid. And so you, to be able to secure contracts, it gives you that, that peace of mind for a lot of these guys to go ahead and commit their entire summer because, you know, they have their NBA stuff figured out at this time. So I do think that also, you know, plays into the fact that they're able to get this group together and have everyone buy in. No, definitely. Um, And that's, that's something where you can really never begrudge a guy is especially when he's entering free agency to go play in these tournaments. The one that I've always been a little bit more curious about is the, the rookie stuff. I I get that you want to have a young guy around your team and have them get acclimated, but you look at, say, the value of playing in a summer league game versus the value of being in an international game against, you know, other pros with high stakes where it matters. And I've never fully understood why teams are so incredibly reluctant to have the younger guys go. Like, Zach Eady isn't here for Canada. You look at a potential matchup with the States. Not like, you know, Zach Eady versus Joel Embiid, you know, Bam Adebayo, Anthony Davis. Like, that's a, a fair fight, but you'd like to ha- be able to have that size. Can you speak to kind of the pressure that teams do put on you when you're interested in going to these events, whether it's like you are dinged up and it's an injury where they really don't want to press it for you or when you are a younger guy and they don't want you leaving, you know, all of the the rookie things that they have scheduled for you? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, ultimately you get drafted by a team or you sign with a team, you are, you're an asset to them. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to protect their asset in any way they can, uh, especially if they're getting any kind of feeling that you're not a hundred percent healthy. And for the rookie stuff, I guess, you know, I get it. It's, they want to have their hands on you and they, they want you to be in their system where they can start, you know, showing you their sets, their style of play. And summer league is a good opportunity to do that for, you know, especially in Zach Eady's situation. So I, I, I get it. Um, but again, I think this is a, a, this is a major inflection point for Canada basketball in mm-hmm. terms of making it cool and making this younger generation really want to play for Canada instead of playing for their summer league team, because, you know, it might not be at that point yet, but I, you know, I promise you it's getting in that direction now, especially if Canada continues to, to show at this level uh, and medal in in this Olympics, this next generation of kids, it's just going to be, they're going to be even more eager uh, to, 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 you know, continue carrying on that torch and and wearing Canada on their chest. So I'm sure for you as a kid, you know, Steve Nash, although I don't know how young you would have been when, you know, he's Oh, two Olympics and the Australia stuff. It's, 
like the impact of that on young basketball players and obviously like, you know, Vince Carter later, but the international stuff, Canada went so long without it. This is actually why I think Shea is even more important than we give him credit is that not only is this guy the best player on the team, he's incredibly cool. Like when you get to the ends of these games, like the way that he finished off Greece, where it's like, yeah, he gets, uh, he gets a double team, breaks it down, breaks both guys ankles, goes to the basket and finishes over Giannis and Dekumbo. And then, you know, he's talking trash, sticking up for his teammates. Like the guy carries himself incredibly well. Um, I think he's very popular on social media. Um, and he's there closing games and winning games for Canada. I, I actually think that his impact in terms of the program is going to be, it, it's almost, done. Like it's almost as important as it is for this team to meddle. Of course that will help things, but I actually think Shay's buy-in and who he is and what he represents for this team right now is bigger than we've given it credit for. Man, you, you hit the nail on the head right there. Uh, and, and that's uh, ultimately the difference maker is having a guy like that. Yeah. One, the on the court, the on the court ability is, is definitely a huge factor uh, but it's everything that he just, you know, he has it. Yeah, you, he does. Sometimes you can't even explain what it is, but it's the way you carry yourself, the way you talk, the way you act, um, you know, your confidence, your swagger, and then again, the performance. And being able to put the ball in his hands at the end of any game, whether it be against U.S. or mm-hmm. today against Spain, it's that's really the difference maker because we didn't have – we didn't have that caliber talent. Even in 2015, mm-hmm. we were all good players, but we didn't have anyone like that. And no. so that's really going to be, you know, Canada's crutch at the end of the day. You know, that they can have a bad game, but if Shea's out there balling, they have a chance to beat anyone. Yep. So that, that's, that's, that's really the game changer for Canada basketball. You know what the it is to me is you can look at all the outfits Shea wears and he looks incredible. Put that on any other human essentially on planet Earth that unless they don't have it, you're like, you look like the biggest idiot. <laughs> like <it's>, like, you <laughs> know, if anybody in this room tried to wear some of Shay's outfits, it's like, hey, don't come to work tomorrow. You need time off because some, something's going on in your personal life that you're not that you haven't really worked out yet. So yeah, maybe just uh, maybe just take a little uh, break. Okay, so uh, Powell and Olenek, the only two holdovers remaining from when you played on the team in 2015. And again, these are two guys that like basically show up to every single thing. Can you guys speak to, you know, your relationship with those two guys and and what this means to them as they're here on this stage later in their careers, like actually getting there, actually getting to the Olympics? Yeah, you know, know, seasoned vets and they've showed up every summer when they've been asked to, they show up and, you know, they do everything they can for Canada to to get them to this point. So uh, to be able to see it through, I I think for them has got to be such a sweet feeling uh, after kind of all the failed attempts throughout the years and now to put themselves in a position to really meddle like I, I you know mm-hmm. I think this team can really do it and so I know it's going to be such a proud moment for them and it's going to be an emotional moment I would imagine uh, just remembering everything that it's taken to get to this point but those guys are just true professionals you know guys that know how to play at the FIBA level know how to play at the NBA level take care of themselves lead by example um, and, and they're both great friends of mine, good people off the court as well, uh, which, which, which helps. So, uh, I'm really happy for them. I'm proud of them. And, you know, I'm just rooting for them to get this medal at the end of the day, a gold would be nice, but mm-hmm. you know, I think at this point, any medal, uh, would be a huge win for this country. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, it was a little, it was a little eye opening watching the state's exhibition game. And I knew it was an exhibition game, but just the size, man. Like that's the one where, especially the international player, you can knock the ball off the rim. Like the, the guys that the States can throw at you up front compared to Canada size, it just, it does seem like probably too big to overcome. I don't want to write them off in that game, but no, the, I think the expectation is a medal. And honestly, if you were going to, I asked you what surprised you so far and doesn't seem like any of this has, you know, made you a surprise other than, like you said, the, the, the level of the chemistry. But to me, the way that they handled Australia in that second half, like that's a really good team. That's 11 to 12 guys on that roster who are pros, like NBA pros, um, a team that's chock full of guys that have that international style who have been there many times over seasoned and Canada's kicked their ass. Like it just didn't feel like those two teams were particularly close in the second half when the chips were down. And again, to the kind of Shea and RJ factors of they just didn't feel like they had guys like that. I, I think at this point, 
it, it feels weird to say, but no, it would be pretty disappointing if Canada didn't medal. I, I feel like it's the States, it's them, and then it's everybody else. No, I, I, and I agree. What stood out to me, too, was uh, just game one. You know, they got out to a double-digit lead against Greece yeah. within the first quarter. And, you know, it, it's their first game in the Olympics. Like, it very easily could have been a moment where there were some nerves and, you know, some jitters out there. But, again, they look like they belong. And mm-hmm. that's the way they carry themselves. And so... I think beating USA will be a tough task. There's no doubt about it. Like I think USA has kind of caught their rhythm now and they're playing well together. But the beauty of this is it's not a seven game series. It's one, you know, when you play a team in the Olympics, it's one game. And so anyone, as we lost to Venezuela in 2015, anyone can beat anyone in a one game scenario. So it's going to come down to everyone having their a game uh, scouting report and then maybe even a little bit of luck. Sometimes you just need to get a little, get a little bit lucky to, to, to win a gold medal. So we'll see. Yeah. And again, like if you're trying to make that comparison, you guys in the qualifying rounds had a plus uh, point differential of plus 135. Venezuela was minus six. So if you look at it from that discrepancy, you know, Canada is not that far apart from the United States. Um, I just don't know if, you know, Jordi Fernandez can be as greasy as that Venezuelan coach who was a cheater. <laughs> I was like, they cheated me. I was like, I, I'll hate that guy till the day I die. <laughs> like, I will truly yeah. despise that man until I'm in the grave. Like, I will always, I, all the hate in my heart, I'll always leave a little sliver of hate for that guy. Okay, so uh, I did mention, you know, uh, Kelly and Powell. Do you think Canada screwed up leaving Corey Joseph off this team? Like, should Corey Joseph be there? Because he expressed you know, some unhappiness about not being a part of this or not having an opportunity to be a part of it. You know, it, I don't think he would have played on this team, which does change things. You are looking forward to the future. I think it is a complicated question, but yeah. Do you think he should be there? I mean, if I were constructing the roster roster, I probably would have included him on the team. Um, but again, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, anyone doesn't deserve to be there. Like, um, you know, you talk about staples, like the Scrub brothers have mm-hmm. been staples for Canada basketball over the years as well. Like Phil, Phil Scrub was my roommate, um, you know, in 2015 in Mexico city during that whole tournament. So uh, another guy that, you know, has just been there year after year after year showing up and doing everything he can for Canada basketball. And so, you know, you may look at that and say, Oh, well, you know, he's not playing in the NBA. Why sure. would he be on the team over Corey Joseph? And it's like, well, it, it's it's sometimes it's more than that, mm-hmm. and again, showing there's something about showing up every year that matters, and you know, being a part of that, um, you know, being a part of that organization and and building that chemistry and just making it cool to put on a Canada uniform. Like you know, Scrub Brothers are guys that have done that over the years. So, you know, I I would I would love to see Corey on this team, and I think you know he's been through enough where you, you would love you would love for him to get the enjoyment that some of these guys are getting. But again, they decided to go in a different direction. You can't blame him for that. Yeah. Uh, and listen, I'm a Carlton grad, so you'll get no pushback from me on scrub brothers. Like I'm glad that they <laughs> didn't get their shine. Hey Nick, uh, it was great to have you on, man. Uh, great to catch up. And I hope we do it again. I hope we do it actually, you know, Canada's in a gold medal game and maybe we'll do this again. Yeah, yeah, let me know if we if we if we get to a medal game. I would love to to talk a little bit more. So yeah, I absolutely, you have me on. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for doing it. Uh, there goes Nick Stauskas.